Let's begin in a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is a reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed back and forth, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the cunning of men, by their craftiness and deceitful wiles. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Lord, we ask for a renewed portion of your grace that we may know your will and your love for us by knowing what you have taught us through Christ our Lord. Amen. And Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh... I come back uh, this week to talk about Revelation, which is pretty much my favorite thing to talk about, or one of them at least. So when I was in when I was in Rome, I got what's called a license, which is a master's in theology, and it was on this topic, right? So I uh, I just find it to be an incredibly fascinating, deep topic where it's it's not necessarily a, a discussion about what is the content of what God has revealed, but rather what do we know about God revealing Himself? What do we know about um, all of, all of that. Like, how does he do it? What is the process? What is all of these things? We can't go through everything, obviously, but we've we got to start somewhere, right? We, my, in my first uh, talk, we talked all the philosophy, right? We didn't even get into, like, what God actually spoke out very much. We just talked about what do we know without going to Scripture, tradition, or the church? What do we know just by being able to reflect and, and relying on other people's reflections? But when we talk about Revelation, we talk about what, what, where the word comes from. We talk about a, a taking back of the veil, right? So the, that first point, revelare. So it means re, meaning taking back or to do again, and to veil, right? So it's literally God who has veiled himself from our eyes, right? God who is invisible based on the senses that we have, right? We can't reach out and touch God, although we talk about that every once in a while, especially in the Psalms. We never smell God. We never taste Him, even though we taste the accidents of bread when we receive the Eucharist. And we never see Him face to face, even sometimes though there are apparitions. Oftentimes there are angels or of saints or of Mary, but also even when we see God in prayer, it's not, it's not like I see Bill or any of you all. Like, uh, it's it's a f- what's called a phantasm. It's, it's within our mind, but it's not through the same senses. So God shows himself in a way that isn't our natural means of knowledge, right? It isn't through reason, but rather through his ways. So oftentimes, the, the universal acceptance of, of revelation in Christianity is... Scripture, right? Now, slight differences. I get that. Don't worry about it. We'll get to that when we get there. But it starts with, with, with this book, right? But it doesn't really, right? It's, it's what we all agree on, but it doesn't actually make sense because we actually think that the fullness of Revelation is what the letter to the author of Hebrews says is Jesus Christ himself. It is his very person. That is the fullness of revelation. It is God revealing himself, taking back the veil, as he says in, uh, what is it, Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, he, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Right? That, is a, that is a foundational point, that it is Christ himself who shows us who God is through his words and his actions. So where does Christ start in all of this Revelation. Well, it's from the very beginning of his life, but, but it ends when he forms the church. Like, he continues his mission through the formation of the church before anything else, because he doesn't go off, right? The, the, the way, we, way we look at it is, look at, if we look at Matthew uh, chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, the last two verses of Matthew's gospel, it is what's called the Great Commission. Right, um, he is ascending back to his father. It's after he has revealed the greatest act of love in human history on the cross and in the and his conquering of death and the crucif- and the resurrection. He spends forty more days teaching them, reminding them about the Holy Spirit that is to come. And then he goes and he, he gathers them up on the hilltop just outside of Jerusalem, and he says, "Go therefore, 
Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all of I have commanded, and lo, I will be with you until the end of days. What he didn't say is, I now go to my Father, here's your book. Right? He didn't say, here it is. This is, this is all you need, you'll be fine. Just read it, it's pretty self-explanatory. There's no way you could get it wrong after this, so you'll be fine. No. No, he said, you're going to need a church. You're going to need some sort of authority, right? And it's not just man, human authority. If it was just human authority, man, that church would have fallen apart years ago. Probably about, well, 1950 years ago. But instead, the church survives because she is the guardian of a deposit of revelation. We'll break that apart. So what does it mean when we say a deposit of revelation? It means that Christ does shows us everything we need to know for our salvation. And then some, actually. But he, at a minimum, shows us everything we need to know. Right? What it means to have faith, what it means to follow in God's footsteps. Okay? That's the deposit of revelation. But he tells us himself, right? In, in John, uh, let's, let's say, chapter 14 and 15, that he, you're, we're not going to understand it right away. Right? He's been teaching us all of these things, but we, we, we're not going to get everything all at once. So I'm going to send you an advocate who will tell you what, you what you have forgotten and what you need to know, who will fulfill everything you need to know. That Holy Spirit is, is the guarantor of, the, of, the, of uh, the church's authority and the, and the church's guidance of and guardianship of this deposit of revelation, of all that she teaches. That the church doesn't have an ounce of authority on her own. Right? That's why last week uh, Father Larry talked not only about the divinity of Christ, but also Christ or the church as the spouse of Christ. Because if that's true, if the church is, is the spouse of Christ, then everything else that follows about the church's authority makes sense. But if it's not, well, it's, there's no reason we should believe her over any, not only any other church, but any other business, any other government. Yeah. Why do we refer, yeah, so why do we refer to the church as a her? Um, basically because she is revealed as the, the bride of Christ. And so, yeah. Um, and so the church uh, has this um, guarantee because of the Holy Spirit, because of the divine power who, who lives and moves within her. But she doesn't have, a, even within that, a chance to create something new. Right? That, that when we talk about Revelation, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit from what's in front of you. We're, we're talking about God showing himself and then us responding to it. Right? That that's, that's our membership within the church is our act of faith. So God has pulled back the veil in Jesus Christ. And we're saying, yes, I believe that. That that's, that's the nature of this dialogue between God and man is... God, God move first, and then we respond back. All right. Now, when, when we talk about Revelation, the, the primary thing that we use, we talk about, like I mentioned, was, is scriptures, the written word. But it's not, there are two other, what we call legs of, 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 of Revelation, right? And I, I have these three pencils bound in a rubber band. But this isn't really a flat surface, but I need to do it for the sake of the camera. So, if you, ever, if you imagine a stool or, or watching these three pencils, three, three pencils tend to work. They tend to stand up. They rest against each other. They're bound. But they, unless you tilt them, they stay standing. Right? These things have been standing for like 45 minutes until I put them on this book. Right? But if you try and remove one and do the same thing, if it works, it's basically a miracle, right? Like you have to be so gentle with it for it to stay erect. It's basically impossible. Not to say that I spent a lot of this afternoon trying this, but I spent more, more time than I should have making sure that it wasn't going to stay upright, right? That, that one, or two, one thing will not stand up straight, right? It'll fall over. Two won't. Three together resting on each other is how we view revelation in the church, we view it as not that they ever compete, but that they rest against each other and guarantee our ability to get to the source of revelation, which is God himself. Right? So we have this scripture. We have what we call sacred tradition, 
which is different than traditions, okay? And then we have the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church, which is not a creative source, but rather a guardianship and an interpretive source. We'll, get, we'll swing back around to that, I promise. Let's start, though, with, with the very basics. This, this scripture, this book, the written words that have been pretty much the guarantee of, of God's presence in the world for some 5,000 years. Because, as we know, Christianity came out of the Jewish faith. Right? So all that, all that the Jews considered canonized scripture, so do we. Right? So the difference is <laughs> they didn't have councils like we have councils because they didn't have a church to say this is what, this is what a council would look like. Right? They have several different schools and some of them agree and some of them don't. But they, they kind of have these, this set number of books, these 46 books, that, that are scriptural. Okay? Now, if you look on page 2, you'll see uh, the canon of Scripture, and there's an Old Testament and New Testament, and you'll see seven books that are bolded in the uh, Old Testament, um, the OT. Um, and basically, those seven books are the ones that are in Catholic Scripture, but not in Protestant Scripture. Right? Um, there are several theories as to why, but basically, uh, since about 360 AD, the, every Christian throughout the world had those, <laughs> that same list of Scripture, and only at the Protestant Reformation did those seven books get removed. So it's not that the Catholics said, oh, no, 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 now we need to add more books. No, it's, it's, it was pretty much pretty set from the beginning. But you'll hear, I'm just going to address one common Protestant critique of, of our understanding of Scripture. They'll say that the Catholic Church never canonized a list of Scripture until the Council of Trent, which is in the 15th century. It sounds like a long time to go, 1,500 years before saying this is what Scripture is. And, and it's true, <laughs> but we also didn't define the divinity of Christ until 325 AD. Why? Well, because nobody questioned it. Right? There's no reason to define, a, the church doesn't define a, an issue until some, somebody questions it. So for 1,500 years, everybody said, well, the Bible's the Bible. <laughs> that why, would I, why would I question and take these out? So, so why, why did it take till Trent? Well, because now, now we have to. Um, and why did those books get taken out? There are several theories. Some say um, that they supported doctrines that... Um, Luther and other present reformers uh, wanted to just not have in their scripture. Some say because they thought that um, they weren't, weren't really canon in, in certain Jewish schools. Um, but it would, it, let's just say, some, it, d- it depends. You can, you can defend all of them very strongly, including the fact that in certain New Testament writings, they actually refer to some of the Old Testament books, including these seven books that are only in Catholic Scripture. So it kind of doesn't make sense to not think they're scriptural. Um, but we'll, that's a whole different lecture that I can get way, way distracted on, as you can see. Um, but let's say about what is Scripture... Oh, sorry. Yes, I should look up. Start there. Uh, s- some of them I'm not, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not 100% sure on the whole history, but it starts with Luther and other um, reformers, yeah. If you have time can you go a little bit into, like, Martin Luther and how he started the Protestant Reformation? I can do that. Okay, yeah, we'll do it at the end. <laughs> uh, so, we'll, say what is, we'll start with what does Scripture say about itself. We'll start with 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17, so that's... Sorry, B1, okay? But as for you, continue what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from who you learned it. All right, we'll just skip to, to verse 16. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. That Scripture says of itself that the starting point is it's inspired by God. Right? So every written word we, will, we profess is both written by God and written by man. Now, the theory as to why is how this inspiration works. There are several. There's, there's like a very famous uh, painter, Italian painter named Caravaggio, who looks up the inspiration of St. Matthew. It's a cool painting. Look it up. 
Probably not how it worked, right? It's a little angel whispering in the ear of Matthew telling him what to write. Probably not it, right? Probably not a physical angel sitting on the shoulder. But, so that's, that's one way. The second is like this ecstatic theory. Also probably not true that there was like, that the person is basically just a, an inanimate object and like God is, is making them write the words and they don't have their, their use of their faculties. The most likely thing is, that, that a minimum that we, that we profess is to say that the Holy Spirit guarantees that nothing that was written in this book was false for the sake of our salvation, right? So we're not gonna, we're not gonna find out, you're not gonna go to the pearly gates and you're gonna find out that, oh my gosh, this whole time his name wasn't really Jesus, right? And that his, that, that name isn't powerful, right? Like, like those things are guaranteed. Like everything that's written down is, is a hundred percent certain and it's good for every for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for and training in righteousness, right? So, uh, and then and then, so then the next the next quote is from a, a, a document called Dei Verbum, which is uh, uh, the, the Constitution on Divine Revelation in the Church. It's the it was written in 1964 during the Second Vatican Council, which will kind of come swing around to what that. Uh, the power of an ecumenical council is, but basically uh, it is the church saying this is what we believe. And it's, let's see, 34 paragraphs long, I think, if I remember correctly. It's actually a really good document. It's very readable. It's available online for free um, on the Vatican website. So just Google Dei Verbum. And it's really just kind of a nice little step through of like what we, what we believe and what we do. But I refer to it over and over again because it also happens to be one of only like two official church documents on like what do we mean by revelation so if you want to know what do we say about it it's a really great place to start um and then another great quote to, to what the scripture says is hebrews 4 13 12 and 13 which is the the word of god is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword piercing until it divides soul from spirit joints from marrow it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one whom we must render an account. Now, one of the great things to remember about especially New Testament writing is that, but it also applies to Old Testament writing, especially the later stuff, these guys weren't writing Scripture. Right? Like, like, Paul didn't sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write this letter to the Galatians, and I'm expecting people 1,500, 2,000 years from now to know that this is inspired by God. Right? They were writing letters. You know, letter to the Hebrews, letter to the Philippians, letter to the Colossians, right? Um, they, were, they were writing down something that they thought was important, but not necessarily that these, this was the inspired word. That that inspiration, that guarantee, that, that understanding, that acceptance of it is something later thing. So when Hebrews, in this, in this letter that um, the author is, is unknown, when it says the word of God is alive and active, uh, he is not thinking the written word. I mean, he is, but he's also thinking what we would understand as revelation, that there are things that are beyond what is written and that there is a living church that is alive and active and that can pierce into the heart of man down to this very day. That this is not just a past history, but truly an act, an act of living faith. That that's why we have this, this really great insistence on not just being this object, no, oh, powerful as it is, I'm not, I hate trying to sound like I'm demeaning scripture in any way. It's incredibly, it's beyond incredibly important, but it is not um, the the only word, uh, or the only access to the word, we should say. Um, but again, it's incredibly important because Saint Jerome says ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. Saint Jerome is important in the Catholic world. He's the first. Uh, first one to translate scripture from the original language. So he took the Hebrew and the, the Hebrew of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament, and translated it into Latin, into what's called the Vulgate, the first translation. <laughs> okay, funny story? Not really. It's actually not funny. It's not a story. Vulgate <laughs> is, comes from the word vulgar, right? As in the vulgar tongue, okay? Which means like 
not a sacred language, right? The Greek and the Hebrew, those are sacred languages. You use them only for this purpose. Latin was what they spoke, right? Everyone kind of mocks the church, for, or mocked the church, especially in the Middle Ages, like much later. Like, oh, no, 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 they, they kept it in Latin because that nobody could read it. No, no, everybody could read it. Right? Like, like, that was the only language you could read. You wouldn't be able to read in French. You could speak it, you know, but you, you could only read Latin, you know? Now, by the time the printing press comes around, Gutenberg, that, that changes. You start having books in German and in, Latin, and in Italian and all these other languages. But, like, Cyrillic, right? If you ever talk about, like, the Cyrillic alphabet, it doesn't come till St. Cyril in, like, the ninth century. Right? Like it's, it's, it's never been written down until that point, let alone have any books. You know? So just keep that in mind as we think of how we view Scripture, that from the 4th or 5th century, we've already put the Scripture in the language of the people, even though it's not the language that I could read right now off you know, easily. Um, all right. We'll skip that second quote from Dave Abram 13 and skip down to John Paul II's quote, Pope St. John Paul II. The Word of God is the first source of all Christian spirituality. It gives rise to a personal relationship with the living God and His saving and sanctifying will. And there's a letter to, for, uh, in honor of the men and women in consecrated life, so vita consecrata. All right. And to just highlight again, how the access that it gives us is another St. Jerome quote. The Lord's flesh is real food and His blood real drink. This is our true good in this present life. To nourish ourselves with His flesh and to drink His blood in not only the Eucharist, but also the reading of sacred scriptures is real food and real drink. <laughs> These aren't opposites. <laughs> the sacraments and the scripture and tradition are all meant to be to feed us. They're all meant to, to be a unified thing. They're not three pencils standing far apart from each other, but rather resting upon one another to be able to work more perfectly. That St. Jerome is highlighting this. St. Jerome is kind of a grump, which is why I like him. But he, like, he's highlighting this so forcefully because he knows that how important this is for us. And the church actually still knows this. That's why during Mass, you don't have a Mass without the reading of Scripture. And not only that, but a priest and, and religious are called to what's called the Liturgy of the Hours, right? Which is prayers between five and seven times a day, right? That are based strongly in Scripture, right? So usually it's three psalms and another reading from Scripture, whether from the New Testament or the Old Testament, and one that's even longer, um, a longer reading from the New Testament or Old Testament Scripture, that it's meant to be this mutual benefit, you know, of, of, the, of the actual flesh of Christ in the Eucharist and the, the, the access to God's unchanging ways in Scripture. All right. And then it also is meant to transform us, right? Pope Benedict XVI, Pope Emeritus, who um, says that if we, if we do well to start praying with Scripture as a church, if this was like, like becomes part of the highlight, that it'll bring about a new springtime in the church in terms of spiritual renewal. That there's, there's very little, there are, very, there are few devotions that are more powerful than this, right? Um, and any devotion that is devoid of sacred Scripture, um, is just is never going to compare, right? Which is why the rosary is so strong because it's actually based very strongly in Scripture. Obviously, the Our Father, the Hail Mary is half in Scripture. the The whole meditation that you're supposed to do is are in acts of Scripture, right? That, like it's just because we don't open a book doesn't mean we don't have access to the same thing, and it's part of this spiritual renewal. So this is kind of um, a very um, a very important thing to to remember is that. Oftentimes, we think of Scripture as an apologetical tool, or so sort of like defending the faith, or, and especially against um, uh, fellow believers, but um, or like a theological tool that it, it gives like really cool knowledge, but it's not really important for my faith life or for my spiritual life, my interior life. Um, but it's it's Scripture actually is is starts from that, right? And so the bottom of page three is this. Um, 
is, is, is a, really is a way too short understanding of how to pray with Scripture. But it's, 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 it's an ancient practice called Lexio Divina because we like to put all of our prayers in Latin, um, but it just means holy reading. Okay? Um, and those four steps, that one, two, three, four, um, that's all it is. It's a reading, a meditation, a prayer, and then a contemplation. And so one of the first um, promoters of this type of prayer compared it with eating. So the first thing you do is you take the food in. Then you chew on it. Then you savor it. And then it's the sweetness itself. It's that after effect. Like that's the, that's the nature of the prayer. So we just read it first. Then we take it a little slower. Almost just a little slower, right? And it's, and it's a way to commune with God and um, just something to, 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 if you, especially, not especially, but uh, oftentimes when you're struggling, going to scripture almost anywhere, not anywhere, but almost anywhere, you, you can benefit, right? And when I say almost anywhere, try and read Leviticus 11 and pray with it, right? Like it's just hard, right? It's, it's, it's beneficial. Or, or like 2 Kings. I'm just finishing 2 Kings, and it's just a bunch of names. And this guy failed. He did not walk in the ways of the Lord just like his father did, and now he's buried here, right? And it's cool, and it's, it's, it's very helpful um, as a whole, but like as you're reading it, you're just like, man, God, where are you in this, right? Um, <laughs> Especially when you read it day after day. Um, so, are there any questions in that before we move on to tradition? Okay, great. So the second thing, and this is where um, this is where we start getting a little a little separate from. Oh, I picked the one that didn't work because I'm going to pick it up again. Is, is tradition, which I know how to spell. All right? Now, so we, within the church there is this understanding of sacred tradition, right? Coming from traditio, which means to hand down, right? That's all, that's all we're getting at is how do we hand down this faith? Because the faith doesn't start in any one physical source, but rather in, in the person of God, and that this understanding of what the faith is, this regular fidei, has existed in the mind of the church since the very beginning, right? And that that's actually how scripture begins to be started, is it is able to be written down, is that there was already a sense of what is real within the faith and what has to be rejected um, as a faithful understanding of who God is, right? Somebody comes forward and says, you know, Jesus wasn't a man, he was an alien, right? Well, okay, no, he wasn't, right? Like, that's just obviously false, right? And that's part of what it is, is that we, we may not have, to, we may not always voice it, but we do start to understand, you know, that like what is right and what is wrong in terms of the faith that has been handed down from you. But I want to defend tradition uh, from Scripture, which is always fun to do. Um, but it's, let's, just, let's just go through those first three quotes um, under the heading of tradition. So I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions just as I handed them on to you. That's Paul writing to uh, people of Corinth in his first letter, chapter 11, right? That he's, he mentions traditions right off the bat. Right, like, like Paul doesn't Paul doesn't mess around. He knows that he is not he is not writing scripture, but yet the scriptural understanding, this scripture points to the fact that there was stuff handed on that that isn't just a written word. That there is a way to know God outside of the written word. It's not a bad thing. And then when he writes to the Thessalonians, so then brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold fast to the traditions that were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now, either the scriptures are not alive and, act alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing bone and marrow, like it says in Hebrews, or it is, and this is still true today, right? That this is still true to this day, that, there, that the traditions are held both in the written word and by our mouth, right? Um, and we'll, we'll swing around to when, when those, these moments do come up uh, a little bit down the road, especially in the magisterium of the church. And then, this is one of my favorites, because everybody, when I found this out m much, much too late in my life, um, that, <laughs> that this was like one of those moments where I was like, oh man, like that's, that's actually kind of a, 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 like a, like a wake-up call. 
In Acts chapter 20, in all things I've shown you that by so toiling one must help the weak. Okay, great. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. All right? So the whole, it is better to give than to receive, which I just thought was a nice thing we said to each other, especially the little kids when they were, you know, being brats at Christmas time. But I, like, I was like, oh my gosh, wait, this is not only scriptural, but he's saying <laughs> there are things in the gospel like, there are things that Jesus said that we know that Jesus said that we didn't write down in the Gospels. Because it turns out, just like John says at the end of his Gospel, if we were to write down all of the works and sayings that Jesus said, it would fill more books than could fit in the world, right? That, that there has to be this ability to hand down this tradition that is not just written, even though most of it is written down. Um, and nothing that is in tradition will ever contradict what is written down. Yes? Do you have an example of that? Of things... Something that passed down that wasn't necessarily in Okay. Oh, that was like a quote like that? I don't know. There wouldn't be a quote like that. Like, there, we, don't, we don't usually... We don't want to say more than more than it is. But how about how about the divinity of the Holy Spirit? Right? Like there's nowhere in scripture that says the Holy Spirit is God. We know it. You know, everybody in here everybody in here believes that. Um, I, I would say a lot of what we believe about Mary um, would be traditional. Nothing would contradict scripture for sure. Um, but it's not gonna be quite as explicit maybe as a um, like a historian would like to hear. Um, yeah, even, um, yeah, there, there are probably like other, other smaller things like how, how we celebrate the sacraments might be, a, might be a way to describe it, but not necessarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 and, and without a doubt, there are things that happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but things that are that are explicitly handed down. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I, w- I wouldn't be able to pick other things that are off the top of my head. Um, but, and and part of that is also because, uh, part of what we mean by it, and this is this is the important thing about tradition is that. When we talk about Scripture, we talk about the, you know, 27 books of the New Testament, was it, 46 books of the Old Testament. We talk about a very limited number of, of words and pages. Right? Like, you can say this is in Scripture, right? Because it's in book, chapter, and verse. Right? Like, you can say with divinity that this is it. In tradition, it's not just that. And this is where it gets hard. But rather, it is the passing down of how to understand it. Why has this become important? Because... Oh, I got it. Like, are you trying to link like, what's important to each of the Scripture? Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. you're not the conception. Yeah, yeah. The assumption of our lady. Right. Those are the, those are the big ones. There's not... Mary, yeah, that's what he said, Mary. That's kind of where I went. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. one of the doc... We'll get to this later. Right. People ask, well, how do you know Mary is in the heaven? Right. That was not in Scripture. Mm-hmm. Implicitly, yes. Yeah. But explicitly, you're not going to say Mary went to heaven and her body's up there. Gotcha. Yeah. Like, but to tradition, pass it down. We know from the beginning times that's what happens. It's been passed down from the mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and, and so the tradition becomes not just a, a limited set of this is, this is our traditions, right? They're actually, you will never find a complete book, even though there's one that's actually pretty good called Denzinger. I think it's about 150 bucks, unfortunately, and it's like incredibly dense to read, and I think some of it's not even translated out of Latin, but that's okay. But it's actually not meant to be another source in the same way. Right? It's not meant to be, you know, oftentimes we do this, but it's, it's cheap, is to do, we have our scripture and we have our tradition, right? We hold up the catechism. But that's not true, right? This isn't tradition. This is helpful. This is an amazing tool. Don't, I'm not belittling it at all. But tradition is meant to be the way that we understand things. Why does it become important? Because we have things like John's gospel, 
Okay, John's gospel is actually kind of problematic in certain verses. Right? If you think about it, he says the Father is greater than I more than once. Well, wait a second. If, if I'm reading this and I've never thought for a second and I don't know what Christianity is and all I've done is read this book, then I think that God the Father is here, Jesus is down here, and they are not co-equal. Right? But tradition tells us that they are. That the handing down of the faith is not more words, but rather the means in which it has been given down to us that we know how to understand that verse correctly. That we know that that doesn't actually conflict with what the rest of Scripture says about Jesus being God. That this isn't something that should trouble us at all, but rather it's just a matter of saying... Faith isn't just the written word, but rather, and, it's ne- and it could never be, because then it would only be for the intelligent, which nowadays we look in you know, the United States and Western Europe, we're like, okay, yeah, yeah, but everybody can read, right? But most people couldn't throughout history, and a lot of people in the world today can't. Do those people have access to the faith? Are they saved? Yeah, yeah, it turns out you don't have to read to go to heaven, right? It might help a little bit, but you don't have to, right? That, that, that's what the tradition is. It is a handing on of not just new things and, and information, but rather an understanding of the faith. Still with me? Yeah? Okay, good. So, there's a really... Uh, and this is where... This is where we start to see a little bit of leaning against each other. Where in Scripture does it say the names of the book of Scripture? <laughs> You're right. You are sorry because it doesn't. <laughs> right? It never, nowhere in Scripture does it say these, these are your books of Scripture. Right? Because how would you do that? How would that help you at all anyway? But we, we know what it is. Why? Because it's been handed down to us. Right? That's part of the tradition of the church, is what are the books of the Bible? What, what is Scripture? Because, if you watched my history class, you would know about this, but nobody expects you to watch that, because I didn't even watch it. Right? But you had people, <laughs> thank you for laughing, uh, you had people like Clement of Rome, who wrote amazing letters to other uh, churches throughout the ancient world. You had things like the Shepherd of Hermes. I don't know how to spell shepherd. All right, Hermes. That these these are letters that had or the Didache, which was kind of like the first catechism, right? Meaning the teaching of the twelve. That these kind of books, right? These letters are almost like identical in certain ways with with Paul's letters and the letter to the Hebrews and the Romans, especially. That they're they're a little bit longer. They're they're understanding. And they're actually, I think. I think this was written in 95 AD, this was 85, and this was 65. Like, these are early books, but they didn't meet the criteria of Scripture. So we've always had these ancient re- readings that are, have high, very high esteem. That's why you can, I could limit them, name them off the top of my head. is because they have a great purpose, and they help us understand the faith in a deeper way. But they're still separate from the inspired Word of God to, that, to be written down. The reason for that is how the scripture came to be formed, right? Which had certain criteria, right? So it had uh, what's called apostolicity, which means that it was either written by an apostle or one of his disciples and nobody later. It was orthodox, meaning it always had everything, every word within it um, was was already part of the regular fide, what what the community already believed. Um, It had to be used in the liturgy, Right? And throughout the world, basically. World being pretty general in this sense. It was pretty much the Mediterranean. But, you know, it, it, was, it wasn't just used in one or two communities, but rather everybody was like, oh man, this is something. This, there's something to this. Um, that this is part of how the faith gets handed on, is this understanding that still remains in motion today. Okay? Um, Great. And it's worth, here's, here's a great quote from St. Irenaeus of Lyon, who was, I think he's often depicted with a lion, right? Which is just always, you always listen to the guy who's depicted next to a lion, right? And he says, if the apostles themselves had left us no scripture, if, he knows they had, would it not be necessary to follow the order of tradition that they have transmitted to those whom they entrusted the churches, 
It is precisely to this order that many barbaric nations who believe in Christ have given their assent. They possess that salvation written without ink or paper by the Holy Spirit in their hearts, and they keep the ancient traditions most carefully believing. That Irenaeus knew that it isn't necessarily a written word, but rather a living faith. And that tradition is part of how we understand the faith to be alive, right? Because things that are part of what we would call it's more probably falls a little bit more into the magist- magisterium, but it also does fit within tradition, are a lot of the moral questions that we hold today. Where in Scripture does it say, uh, this is always dangerous, oh no, I'll use a different example. Where in Scripture does it say that you can't use IVF, in vitro fertilization, right? Nowhere. Why? Because why would it know anything about in vitro fertilization in, you know, 50 AD? Or what does it say about, you know, uh, you know any, any number of issues that come up today? It, it really doesn't. It doesn't say much. You know, it might say, thou shalt not murder, but it doesn't say thou shalt not have an abortion or thou shalt not commit euthanasia. That these things are terms that, that come up later that need to still be able to ha- be handed down and that need to have a, a little bit more living sense than just the scripture. And so these are the things that we call sacred tradition because they've never changed. They still hold on to how this same faith has always been handed down and that the community that exists today that holds fast both to scripture and tradition would would be able to accept a time-traveling monk from the 5th century and that they would be able to walk in and be like, oh yeah, this is my church. Eh, there's a little bit different. You know, the walls are a little bit strange and it's much more comfortable inside because there's like heat even though it's cold outside you know like but but they'll be able to be like but i still believe what you believe you're still confessing that same creed that i knew 1500 years ago that's what we mean when we talk about tradition so there's a great one of the great um theologians and who reflected on tradition is uh, a dominican priest named yevs kangar french uh which is why his name is yevs uh which has got to be one of the better names and uh, that doesn't get used very often. And if you could use proper names in Scrabble, this would be a winner, right? Y-V-E-S, okay? That Yevs Kangar had this as great understanding of how we understand tradition in the church, and he talks about the five monuments of, of tradition. He says scripture, um, which we reflected on a lot already, the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church, the liturgy, the fathers, and, um, and then spontaneous practices and gestures of faith, right? So the liturgy being how we worship actually reveals a lot about who God is, right? Now, some of this does come from Scripture. A lot of it actually comes from Scripture because a sacrament is, um, is an outward sign instituted by Christ to confer grace. So all of these things are found somewhere in Scripture, although to varying degrees of, of, of uh, precision, but they, they reveal something about um, how we understand God throughout everything that we do, right? Some of it being like, and I don't want to get into too much into the particulars of a sacrament, but things like, why do we confess to a priest instead of just um, you know, asking God forgiveness? So of course God can forgive, but he also likes to use intermediaries. Everything he has ever done in creation uses some intermediary, including creation itself, when he tells the angels to do it, right? <laughs> like, like, this is not just something that we think is fun, because nobody in 2,000 years of church history has ever said, you know what's my favorite thing in the world to do is confession, right? Like, we like it, and I, I, mean, I, I mean, I enjoy going. It's, it's, it's always a, a nice to know that your sins are forgiven and your soul is clean and you're rejuvenated and a new person in Christ again. But it's not the best part of being a Christian, you know? That, that like, but we do it to remind ourselves that every action we do is mediated through, Every action directed towards the Father is mediated through Christ, our great high priest, it says in Hebrews. And so we confess to a priest, a ministerial priest on this earth. Um, another pointing of the fact that, that tradition predates Scripture is something like 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right, 23 to 26, in which Paul references back to the Last Supper institution narrative. Now, Paul's letter to the Corinthians is before any of the Gospels, right? So he's not copying off of what Matthew wrote or Luke, right? But rather, he is saying, 
This is what we've already been doing. I'm, I'm 20, 30 years away from Christ's life, and we've already been using this exact prayer um, in our Sunday worship. That, that forms how we understand our, our faith and our response to God showing himself. Okay, I won't spend too much time on this. The last is the magisterium. Um, oh, wait. Are any questions on tradition before? Skip up to magisterium. Ah, when do they start writing scripture with the death of the last apostle? So that's when, that's when, what we, okay. I should have, yes. Okay. <laughs> um, the, there are two types of revelation, all right, that we, that we think about in the church. One is what we call public revelation. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. I was going to, I probably should have started with this, but it's okay. So public revelation is that what we have to believe. Okay? So, Every time you hear something in Scripture, in tradition, or that's taught by the magisterium, that is, that is part of the ascent of faith. Right? That means you have faith. Right? I, I want to believe this because I know that's what God has said. There's also what we call private revelation. Right? So you're praying in the church. All right. That Bill is praying in the church because Bill is incredibly holy. And so he sits there and he kneels down and he sees a vision of the sacred heart that is, it is slightly different than what is normal, but it's very real. And it might even be real. But two churches down, they don't have to believe that that really happened. And they don't have to believe that, you know, it is something to be held. Does that make sense? So that's privately shown to him for his benefit, but you don't have to believe it in the same way that you believe the Gospel of John is Scripture. Make sense? That didn't answer your first question, but... Sure. So the first thing the Father's saying is, without tradition, you don't have a Bible. Because the tradition, he said, was passed on by liturgy, by the preaching. So they said, Jesus said this. Paul says this. It's from the oral tradition, from speaking and preaching. And then, inspired by the Holy Spirit, like Father said, they wrote it down in Form. Probably 50 AD was one Thessalonians, and probably the last was John in 90. Yeah. Revelation maybe. So usually within 40 years it was written. And then over time we had to figure out which were real, which were not real, and that's where the magisterium comes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See that? So tradition leads the world preaching, leads to the written form inspired by the Holy Spirit. But then we have this, well, which ones are real, which are not real, and that's where that third lady comes. Was that like a council? We'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. So the example you gave about Bill, where he sees like this form, this form of the sacred heart, mm-hmm. why do we um, kind of believe, or like why is it so popular, like different aberrations of the Virgin Mary? Like, yeah. Why do we all look at that and say, oh yeah, that's. Yeah. Because it's helpful, to be honest. Like, it's, it's kind of funny. I remember, um, so you'll find. Very f- so some private revelations are proved by the church, right? So that they're allowed to be believed by the faithful. And some, like Bill's vision of the Sacred Heart, has not been believed by the church. So we really shouldn't be spreading it a- around. But like, let's use Fatima. Fatima has, got, has, has become very popular. It's been very well studied recently. And, and that one is like kind of one of those, you know, one of those things where they're scrutinized a lot. Eh, there's even a movie, Fatima, where they kind of show like the scrutiny that the... Um, Receivers of the apparition had to go through. Right? It's, it's, it's kind of a tough uh, experience, especially to put a little kid through. Um, so why do we believe them? For our own spiritual benefit, more than anything else. Um, almost, I, I, I'm trying to think of a revelation that really, like a private revelation that really challenged anything within Scripture. I mean, I guess Fatima saying to pray the rosary every day. I mean, that wouldn't be anywhere in Scripture. But I think constant prayer is something that is, you know, referred to in Scripture. And repentance is almost always, almost always, returning to God is always what the Scriptures are about. It's really amazing. Like, once you see that, it really kind of does get a little boring. 
You know, like, because you're just like, man, it's incredible that we keep doing the same thing, right? So these private relations tend to say the same thing, um, but they just strike our hearts in different ways. So it's, it's not so much an intellectual difference as a, um, I don't even want to say emotional, um, but it's not the same like intellectual assent that, that we need. Um, for example, a buddy of mine made a joke when he got ordained a priest that um, because Our Lady of Lords is an optional memorial in the church, so he will never celebrate it. You know, and he, he had nothing against Our Lady of Lords other than he just wanted to say he could do that. You know, and I was like, you really need life um, to have that kind of sense of humor. But um, yeah, I mean, there are things like that that you can kind of take take the benefit of and, and reject the, the other parts. All right, turning to, to the magisterium, uh, we're going to start with the, the, fa- the scriptural foundation for the magisterium of the church starts with the handing over the keys to Peter, right? Peter has made this great act of faith. You are Christ, the son of the living God. And Christ says back to him, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and what you bind on heaven will be bound which you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, which you loose on earth will be loosed in, in heaven, which is both a power of the keys in terms of uh, sins, but also in terms of there's like keys are keys are an important thing. <laughs> you know, like keys, like he's the steward of the kingdom of God. Right? Have you ever watched Lord of the Rings? Right? Like that's that's pretty much like like the, probably the, the big thing that, that everyone has kind of seen where they talk about a steward, right? Of a kingdom, which basically means he's not the king. But he has pretty much all the power of the king until the king returns, right? That's, sorry to ruin uh, Lord of the Rings for you, but the third movie is called The Return of the King, so you probably should have seen it coming, right? That the steward has this role of sitting on the throne, making all of the same judgments of the king, even though he's not the king, until the king returns, in which case the steward gladly should hand over his throne assuming he's a good steward, right? So that's what's happening here. Why do we know this? Because if we look back at our Old Testament, remember, because St. Jerome says ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ, and he wasn't talking about the New Testament yet, he was talking about the Old Testament, and we think back to the Davidic kingdom, right? In which the, it's the only time a kingdom is, is written in Scripture positively, is David's kingdom, right? That's the only time that God says, this is what a kingdom should look like. And within that, there's a lot of things, obviously, that go on within it. But two of them that are probably most important would be the queen mother, which we'll talk about when we get to Mary. And the other one is that that there are times in which the king leaves his kingdom and he hands over the keys to the steward. That that is part of what the Jewish people knew a kingdom should be like. And so for Peter to be handed over keys, because he wasn't handed over physical keys, because what physical key would there be? But he was known that everybody knew who heard that. They were like, man, there's power being handed over. It's a kingdom I don't know yet, but this is a, if he's really a king, then Peter's it. Then he's the guy, right? And then, of course, if we, if we go back also to the end, the Great Commission, Christ says, all, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And in the fun part is uh, in John 14, he says, I will not leave you desolate. I will come to you yet, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you will live also. Basically, we know that Christ has handed over his authority to the apostles for the sake of of the building up of the kingdom of God, which is heaven, but it's also meant to start here on earth in the church. That that has that structure has always existed from the very beginning. That the Pope we can we can actually name all two hundred and sixty five popes. Right, and you can actually see them in in uh, Saint Paul outside the walls in Rome. They've got little pictures, not pictures, they're mosaics. Um, some of them are mosaics, some of them are some other means, I guess. But anyway, they're little medallions all the way across. Anyway, we won't talk about Malachi's prophecy. But basically, they ran out of room for a little bit there, but they fixed it. Okay? And they, they thought the end of the world was coming. I love that story because it's just like so Italian. Um, but, but what is, so what else does Scripture say, though, as a warning to us about... The, the authority of Scripture on itself. It says in Second Peter's chapter one, Second Peter chapter one, verse twenty. First of all, you must understand this: that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. 
really shouldn't have to go on. But because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. That, that scripture itself says, you don't get to interpret it. That's why we have tradition. That's why it's handed on. That's why it's guaranteed and guarded by this church. Okay? Now, then the question eventually becomes, well, which church is the right one? Of course. So, what do we look at? Well, what looks the most like Christ? What looks most like his band of apostles, right? And not just in moral character, because we really don't want to look at moral character, because one out of 12 would then have to try and kill Jesus, which, you know, actually, if we look at that, Catholic Church is doing pretty good. Um, but that was a joke. That wasn't very good, but it was a joke, okay? Um, that that the, the magisterium of the church, the teaching authority of the church, is, derives only because she stays in union with God. Right? That no matter how much land the church has owned, and in times the church has owned quite a bit of land, no matter how much worldly power it has, right? And if you think of something like uh, Charlemagne getting, you know, crowned the Holy Roman Empire in the, in the Basilica of St. Peter in Rome, that, that's, that's a lot of authority, worldly, or, you know, in France throughout most of its history, that, that all of these things sound nice, but it's nothing next to the guarantee of the Holy Spirit living within it. Now, when does, she, when does the church, when does she exercise her authority? And there are basically, I'm going to try and do this as fast as possible because we are, it's getting a little late, but basically what we call ordinary and extraordinary, right? You'll hear that a lot. So ordinary and extraordinary. Ordinary is the boring. It's the humdrum. It's the, the normal ways of doing it, right? The, um, it's what you're used to seeing, but also there's nothing really kind of that you can point to. It's just kind of the way it's always been. So the ordinary magisterium of the church is what she is, she is taught, as the St. Vincent of Le Pen said, what she is taught always, everywhere, uh, always everywhere, and, and like, like without... Um, like confusion, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean the exact wording is the exact same, but, you know, things like, uh, well, so a lot of these things have now actually been defined, but, humanity. well, humanity, vitae, but I kind of think that's kind of an extraordinary, extraordinary act, unfortunately. But like things like, or 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 I was getting there. I mean, <laughs> I've got the microphone, all right? You will listen to every word I have to say. All right, that, sorry. Um, that the ordination of women, right, is, has, has been uh, excluded in the church from her very beginning. There's never been an uh, ordained female minister, right? And that is part of the ordinary magisterium of the church. It has always been throughout history, that's what it is, throughout history, without confusion, and taught throughout, throughout the lands. But nobody ever said it. It just kept happening, right? Um, now, the extraordinary magisterium is when there is, it's this, right? Because they never conflict, but what we call an act, okay? So, Father Larry pointed out ordinationa sacerdotalis, which is an act of, of what the ordinary magisterium has always said, okay? But, basically, there are, I think, two, two ways this can happen. One is an ecumenical council, and the other, the Pope says so. Now, in very, 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 very limited circumstances. Okay, ex cathedra. All right, ecumenical means throughout the world. Okay, so ecumenical council means the bishops throughout the world are gathered for this purpose. Okay, there have been 17 ecumenical councils, I think. Um, there were f four very early on in the church. I mean, things like Jerusalem. The most recent would be Vatican II, which means, implies it was a Vatican I. But, but there haven't been that many, okay? Like, less than every hundred years, all right? And when you hear things like synod, nothing. That means absolutely nothing in the, in the magisterium of the church. It's nice. You, I mean, I read the stuff that they write because they wrote it, so it should be important. Or you hear things like the Baltimore uh, Council, which was a like, what, 150 years ago, and they wrote the Baltimore Catechism, which was like a foundational catechism for the United States Catholics. But it didn't have this power of ecumenical council, which basically is the gathering of bishops throughout the world in union with the Pope and ratified by him. Okay? So, 
You have things like Nicaea defining the divinity of Christ, or Ephesus defining that Mary is a Theotokos, the, the bearer of God. Um, and, and these things have a guarantee to them. When they speak, when they write something and they declare it, it's true. Or like the Council of Trent, right? It would be another example. Yeah. So, well, so there's several things. One, the College of Cardinals wouldn't be enough. So as, it's getting closer, but it, it wouldn't be enough to, to be able to do it. Um, and then it's never happened that a, the Pope or an ecumenical council has spoken against and it's been handed on tradition. I guess in theory <laughs> it could, um, but if they were... It would be very clear, because we also have this ordinary magisterium and what is tradition, to say that there was something deficient within that, um, in that act that it just, it, we would just have this firm faith in something that we haven't seen yet, that it just couldn't, could not be. Yeah. And then, and then the last thing is this, this teaching of the Pope can speak what's called ex cathedra. So, so the Pope is infallible. That was defined by an ecumenical council, Vatican Council I, interrupted by the Italian Civil War. They never got around to some of the cool stuff they were going to do, but that's okay. But they said that the Pope has this infallibility in which when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, he has the same guarantee and the same the same power, the same yeah, guarantee of the Holy Spirit speaking through him as, as an ecumenical council. How many times does the Pope use this? Twice. All right? Uh, for the Immaculate Conception, uh, right, right after, actually, Vatican I, and for the Assumption, let's find the, the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary in 1950. If you want a very fun read, read uh, Munificentissimus Deus, uh, chapter 40, or paragraph 41, right? So it's like four sentences. But basically, that's the paragraph in which he defines it, right? But it has to sound very specific, right? So the Pope, when he gets on the, when he speaks from the window at the Angelus and he says, and now we are all brothers and sisters, no matter if you've been baptized or not. We don't think that that's, that's infallible, right? Or if he says, that five plus three is now 11, Good luck, economists, right? Like, we don't think that that's something, right? This is a limited power to faith and morals. But not only that, but ex cathedra means that you have to say it in, such a, in a very solemn, solemn meaning, very particular way, which, which he says, and I think in Munificentissimus Deus, he says something along the lines of, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Holy Apostles, St. Peter and Paul, and of our own authority, we declare, define, and confirm that the at the end of the course of her earthly human life, the Virgin Mary was con- assumed body and soul into heaven. Right? Really kind of a beautiful way of doing it. But like, theologians would say, actually, if you got one of those words wrong, the whole thing doesn't work. Right? This is a very limited power because we don't really like having to define things unless there's a real need. Right? Um, so that would be, that's an example of something that does not contradict Scripture. It is part of the tradition, right? He even says it in the document. And it is an act of the magisterium, um, the teaching authority of the church. I know that that was a lot. <laughs> um, and I kind of had to speed up at the end, and I apologize for that. But, yes. Oh, she was first? Okay. <laughs> um, so when we have Vatican II, uh-huh. Besides going to English, we really didn't to mass amount or what? So, so that's, okay. So, <laughs> Vatican II is like its own issue. Because 
there is, there's kind of two things that have kind of come about. One is what the Vatican II actually said, in which case there are only four constitutions, right? So that, that would be probably the things in which the Ecumenical Council really speaks about. And then there's a bunch of like sub-documents, which probably don't have the same authority, okay? Those things that, what they changed, nothing. Right? They, they actually didn't say that we should have Mass in the vernacular. It didn't say that we have to celebrate Mass versus Popeum. It didn't say much of anything, really. It reaffirmed everything that we, are, that we always taught. Maybe emphasized that we should have a renewal in terms of Scripture being preached at Mass and preaching itself at Mass. Most of what we attribute to Vatican II was a commission afterwards, which doesn't necessarily hold the same... Thing. But the other end of it is nothing essential to the Catholic faith changed. So there is, there is that to consider as well, right? It never denied the Eucharist is the, is the real presence of Jesus Christ. It didn't deny uh, the nature of the priesthood. It didn't deny anything that, that a monk from the 5th century would, would, <laughs> would have understood, you know? And that's kind of part of its beauty is that even though we, we look at it and we're like, wow, because a lot, a lot, a lot in the church, life of the church really did change. I mean, we lost the United States. I think we lost 150,000 religious sisters and 50,000 priests or something like that. Like, like the life of the church is wildly different from 1950. Um, some better, some worse. Um, yeah. This, this isn't really that important, but what's the issue that you think will come up in the next kind of council like that? Like, what is the issue that you think will come up in the next council like that? I hope to never see a council. <laughs> I'm not trying to be funny. Um, the... Uh, yeah, that's a good. That, that's one I'd have to. But we just the reason we don't want a council means there's going to be tons of confusion. Yeah. And so there will be a need for it. That's why, like we said, our oh, council is coming. It means there's a lot of division and clarification. Do you anticipate one coming? No, I, I don't. I don't see a council coming. I mean, if it would be at the very end of my priesthood, but I, I think something that might happen would be um, there, there. There does seem to be some back and forth between. Uh, in terms of not, not religious freedom as much as um, the nature of unified worship. So things like, do, do Muslims and Jews worship the same God as Christians? Might, might need to be defined, maybe, if certain things don't, if, if we don't respect religious freedom well. Um, that might be something. There, there might be a few other things. I don't, I don't see any moral issues needing to be defined. They seem, that seems to be pretty clear, but you just don't know. Until, until something new. I mean, you know, a priest, priest speaking here a hundred years ago wouldn't have thought we needed a document on contraception, you know. But we did in 1968. So, yeah. Unfortunately, fortunately, I'm not smart enough to answer that one. <laughs> All right. Are there are there any final questions? Yeah. Any significance between the number of books in the Old and New Testament? The numbers, 46 and 27? No. I don't think so. And that could be, I guess. Like, but. And then the other question would be, why do we have two testaments? Why an old and a new? Oh, because, uh, basically because the defining feature of all of history is the incarnation, is Jesus Christ coming to man. And that is, that is the, the separation, is that, is that new and eternal covenant that Christ came to establish, which is what testament means, is covenant. So. That one I know. <laughs> uh, yeah. oh, great. Well, let's, let's close in a prayer then. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.